What is going on, people? It's Matt from Liquid Loans. Happy Monday to everyone. I hope you're having a good week so far. In this video on this live stream, I have a very special guest. He's a comedian, an author who's published books on Bitcoin, taxes, governments, and why we need less of them. And he also produces regular content for his YouTube channel on economics and the money markets. So with no further ado, the infamous Dom Dom Dominic Frisbee. Sorry, couldn't get it out there. It's all right. Hey, Dominic. All right. How's it going? Very well. That's Thanks for coming on to the YouTube yeah, channel. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about all the delays, but hopefully uh, uh, we've ironed the worst of them out. I've got terrible signal at the moment, but I'm hoping it improves over the course of the show. So stay with us. Stay with us, guys. We've got uh, Dominic Frisbee, who is, uh, yeah, I've been watching your YouTube channel for quite a while, and I really enjoy your walk and talk videos, especially the ones in the woods. Very, very authentic and honest. That's my, That's actually my local graveyard. It's the nearest place to my house that's quiet, but I found one place in the graveyard where there are no gravestones in vision. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah actually, film, if I do it and you see the gravestones, everyone goes, "Why are you in a graveyard?" But oh, it's, okay, it's okay. just at the end of my road, and it's really quiet, so it's a convenient. I thought place you were in the it. woods somewhere, like you know, in a park or something. I know like that, that's the yeah. impression. That's the impression. I've, 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 I'm afraid I've pulled back the curtain, and what's behind the curtain is not as glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really enjoy your your YouTube content. You. I also enjoyed the video that you had with Richard Hart uh, at the end of last year, and yeah, um, that, that was, was quite good. That was a good one. Amazing night. I've never met anyone like him before. He's a character, isn't he? Blimey. <laughs> I feel that he. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. He kind of brushed over some of the stuff about DeFi and Hex and Pulse Chain a little bit too quickly, and you didn't fully grasp it. So I hope I can get you up no, to speed on some of that stuff. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I still don't understand what he's doing at the moment. Well, let's hopefully we can. I wish uh, I did because you know, I would have put money in, but but I just didn't get it. Listen, I'm sure, the guy sure. who was in the Ethereum uh, um, uh, initial coin offering, and I didn't put money in because I didn't. I, I watched the videos and I just thought, what's his name, Vitalik Buterin, explained it so badly. I'm like, mm. oh, I'm not putting the money into that if you can't even explain it. And uh, more fool me. <laughs> I mean, you win some, you lose some, but of course you're, you're trying to protect yourself, right? Something sounds dodgy. Something sounds a bit weird. You think, mm, I'm not sure about this, but Dominic, for the people at home, I'm sure a lot of people know who you are for the one or two who don't, maybe you could give us a quick bio and background on yourself. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a weird life where I'm a, I've, I write about finance, specifically about gold and Bitcoin and money systems and all that kind of stuff. And then, but I also I, I suppose first and foremost, I'm a comedian. I started out as a comedian in the '90s, and uh, my my speciality is comic songs. So it's a weird double life, but it kind of works. My favourite one is the Nigel Farage one. I think. Ah, secretly in love with Nigel Farage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, I know you. I know you. Obviously, you come from a comedic background. Now you got into well, not now, but in the last like ten or fifteen years, you got into money um and finances and you know now you're a holder of bitcoin and ethereum yeah i know that you're did you you hold a bit bitcoin and eth but you seem quite interested in what richard hart was talking about have you learned anything more about hex or pulse chain or anything no then? i started to look at it and i just got more and more baffled and um mm. i you know i'm a bit of a boomer i'm 52 so i'm not quite a, as with it as as you you groovy kids are um but he was going you know, people say you can't invent money out of thin air, but you can. Mm. And I was like, no, I'm not sure, but he seems to be able to. I mean, I've, I've, he was extraordinarily rich or he behaved like he was extraordinarily rich anyway. And, uh, you know, he seems to have done amazing things. And I've looked at the chart of Hex and it's, it, oh, that was another thing. I looked at the chart of Hex and while it had done incredibly well, when I looked at it, this is a month or two ago, it was in a bit of a downtrend. Mm. So I was yeah. like, like well, maybe it's good, but it's not for me just at the moment. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I tried to understand the pulse chain and what I had to do. And what I couldn't get my head around is, say I sacrificed my Ethereum or whatever I was going to sacrifice. I was mm -hmm. like, well, how do I know? What am I going to get for this? I'm just giving you my Ethereum. So I, 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 uh, I struggled to reconcile myself mm. to that. Absolutely. Now you yeah, can no. tell me now why, why I, where I got it wrong. Well, right. Yeah. So the sacrifice, you're making a political statement uh, with no expectations from the work of others because they want to pass the Howie test. 
right? So this is so it's not a security. So basically, you sacrifice your crypto to a political cause in the hope of being airdropped free tokens. Um, so of course, if you're not into crypto or you're not used to that kind of you know vernacular, it sounds a bit weird, right? It sounds a bit dodgy. It sounds so, like so say, you're, you're just yeah, well, yeah, money into a black I, I hole. Yeah, I was under the assumption that somebody was keeping them on the other side. I didn't mm. realize. So say I was sacrificing my crypto to save the Ukrainians or something. Mm. So I would give them my crypto, and in exchange, I would get what pulse. Yeah. So pulse chain's not live yet. So basically, I'm sure he explained it to you. But pulse chain's going to be a hard fork of Ethereum, a yeah, full system that. state copy. In fact, and I'm sure as you're an ETH holder, you know that the gas fees are insane on Ethereum. The whole thing is like crippled. Um, I don't get it. With yeah. So we I mean, need cheaper I get, I get it, but I don't get it. It's like, how can this be expensive? So expensive. But anyway, yeah. yeah, because the, the network's congested and then obviously it's a proof of work network. So you have all the miners who are basically bending everyone over a barrel by charging them, you know, extortionate amounts, $30 to, to send an ERC-20, $100 for a swap sometimes on Uniswap. So Pulse Chain is going to be a hard fork of that. It's going to be an EVM compatible blockchain, which means it's forked from Ethereum and everything's going to be the same. So everything that you own on Ethereum right now, you're going to get a copy on Pulse Chain. So th there's that, which is going to be amazing. Uh, it's not live yet, but it should be within the next couple of months. And But I've missed the, the sacrifice, sacrifice, haven't I? Sorry? I've missed the sacrifice phase. You can actually still sacrifice for it, but the rate gets worse every day. So the rate that you would have sacrificed in the first three weeks of the sacrifice phase back in July 2021 last year is going to be a lot better than what would happen now. I'm not even sure what the rate is, but, you know, maybe you even put, throwing you put a load of money in. Yeah, I've sacrificed for it. Yeah. O on day one to five, I sacrificed. Yeah, quite, quite a bit. And I'm sure a lot of people watching this stream have sacrificed quite a bit now. I wouldn't say sacrifice a lot now, and obviously nothing's financial advice. Everyone needs to do their own research. But when Pulse Chain first comes out, you're going to probably want a bit of gas anyway just to interact on the network, and it's going to be pennies to use Pulse Chain. I mean, literally a penny for a send, a penny to open a stake or, or anything like that. So maybe just chucking in even $10 or $20 to have some gas on day one would be a, uh, a, a just a start, you know, to get yourself get get yourself on the on the ladder so to speak yeah yeah i mean i should sacrifice more but but uh you see the the problem that an aging boomer like me has is to figure out when a new one comes along to figure it out sometimes it takes me like 10 minutes sometimes mm. it can take me hours and mm. and and you know i do get a certain amount of pleasure when i'm playing around with a new wallet or a new coin and seeing how it works and sending and receiving, doing all this because you feel like you're learning. But um, I I'm also just so busy. I just mm. often literally don't have the time sure. to, 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 to take out with it. So, but I, I guess I need to sit down for a few hours and have a play. Well, where do you hold your Ethereum? Do you hold it on a hard wallet or do you, ho do you hold it on MetaMask? In various different places. I've got some on MetaMask. And okay. I've got some in various, various wallets. You can see me scratching the back of my head because I don't want to publicly disclose that information. Of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure you've been in crypto for a while, so your security is pretty good. Hopefully, it's, it's not, not an bad. Extent. I got hacked a long time ago, and uh, I've never forgiven myself, so it's pretty good. Okay, so you learn the hard way. But as long as you know how to use MetaMask, you're going to know how to use Pulse Chain. It's exactly the same as Ethereum. It will literally be going in there and flicking a switch, turning over the network, and it's going to be Ethereum, but cheaper, faster, and it's not a proof of work. It's going to be a proof of um, proof of stake. So basically, there'll be no miners. That's why it'll be so so cheap to transact on it. And it'll be exactly the same as Ethereum. But the difference with Pulse Chain is it's going to be a full system state copy. So do you hold any other coins apart from Ethereum? Yeah. On, on the Ethereum network? Yeah. So uh, let's say yeah, you hold... got... yeah. Go on, you guys. Sure. Let's say you hold Chainlink or BAT or any other token, you're going to get a copy on day one on Pulse Chain. So if you flick that switch, flick it over from Ethereum to Pulse Chain, and then you go into your, your wallet, your MetaMask, and you add those tokens on the Pulse Chain, you're going to get a direct copy. Now, at the beginning, none of those tokens are going to have any value. 
But as soon as someone starts the first trade on the Pulse chain, on Pulse X, which is going to be the decentralized exchange, everything's going to have a value because we've got something called the automated market maker. So without trying to go too too far down the rabbit hole, you're going to have free tokens. And that's going to be the big draw for everyone because everyone's getting so, you know, hampered and, and the prices are so like, basically, you know, everything's everything's completely crippled on Ethereum that if you've got these, these, these duplicate on Pulse Chain, why wouldn't you come over and play around with them and just see how they do? Uh, so, you know, it will be out in a couple of months. And like I said, you could even chuck in, you know, even $50 into sacrifice now. That means that means you'll have some gas on Pulse Chain when it comes out. And it's going to be the same as Ethereum, but just cheaper and faster. So it is it is quite exciting. Yeah, I've got to I've got to find the time and do it. I know I do. Sure. Well, anyway, I mean, moving I have on. To say, he's one of the most bright and impressive people I've ever met. I've never I've never met anyone like him. So Richard Hart. Um, yeah, yeah. He's, he's yeah, a genius. Yeah. He's a genius. Yeah, he really is. Um, Hex, and again, not financial advice, but since the all-time high of Hex in September, uh, it's down about 75%. So if someone wanted to get a good entry, now would be a very good time. But again, not financial advice. Everyone so I got do. that one. At least I got that one right, which is looking at the chart whenever it was a couple of couple of three months ago and thinking this has got further to go. Mm. Um so yeah, I should go and have another look. I mean, hex isn't alone. Everything's. Uh, my theory is that there's four phases to a crypto run. You get quiet accumulation, noisy bull market, and blow off top. Yeah. Third one is um, uh, horrible correction, and fourth one is frustrating consolidation. And we're somewhere between stages three and four: horrible correction and frustrating consolidation at the moment. Yeah. This seems to be it's a very grinding bear market for a lot of the coins some bear markets are just sudden and then it's over and mm. some of them just grind and this is a grinder <laughs> i yeah i agree with you i i don't think it can make its mind up what's, what's it going to do right we have a tiny little pump here and there and then it capitulates and um in my opinion i think we're that's, in some type again of that's market. typical of bear markets is 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 the um you know the bull market the little bounces the little um sharp you know, you in a bull market, you get sharp sell-offs and, and mm. in a bear market, you get sharp rises. Bottom yeah. line, it's a bear market. Um, it'll, and it's not helped by, you know, for for as long as, for, for a long time, probably since 2009, certainly since 2011, there's just been this extraordinary market, bull market in tech. It almost didn't matter what tech it was, whether it was Bitcoin or Facebook or mm. or. 3d printing or whatever there's just been this incredible bull market and and since six months or so ago the market's just fallen out of love with tech won't last forever because it's tech it's the future yeah. it's innovation but but at the moment it's all about the real stuff yeah i mean i i def definitely has been um since since really we had we had a double top on bitcoin last year right so we had may that was the first, I think, time that it crashed. Um, we had, you know, had like a 50, 60% retrace. And then we had that double top, which was, uh, I can't remember how many months later. And since then, it, yeah, it just can't really get back up there. And obviously the whole market is trending behind yeah. that. But, but yeah, it's, it hasn't been, it hasn't been, um, I don't think we're going to see anything to, uh, you know, fireworks. There's a very or interesting like I've always been massively into technical analysis long before Bitcoin came along. Mm. And I find it really interesting how since Bitcoin came along, we now have a bull market in technical analysts. <laughs> Everyone's a technical trader. Yeah. Um, but it does work. The, the problem that a lot of Bitcoin technical analysts make, in my opinion, is fractal patterns. Mm. They're always looking for fractal patterns. This happened in 2013. So this is what's going to happen now. Yeah. And my experience is that fractal patterns are one of the most unreliable um, patterns and they work when they don't, but, but they're just so unlikely to work. And unless you've got a clear exit point where you go, okay, this is the fractal pattern, but if this price isn't reached here, then I'm out. Unless you have a clear exit strategy, I'd be very careful with those. Yeah, well, it's one it thing was, that... Sorry, I was sorry. just going to say about that double top in Bitcoin. Um, one of the most useful 
trading monikers that I've ever come across is from false moves come fast moves in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And that second test of the high, I, I think it went a few thousand dollars above the, the May high. Mm -hmm. And we now know that was a false move. Mm -hmm. And that was a classic from false move come fast moves in the opposite direction. Yeah. Um, uh, it was a classic of the genre. Yeah. I mean, Richard, you know, he's kind of infamous for calling, calling the tops. Uh, he didn't predict the, the second one, but he thinks it's going to go down to 10 K uh, still. I think I can and see that. Thing... Sorry. I can see that. I wouldn't mm. bet on it, but I can see that scenario. I yeah. think um, probably 20 great. I mean, at the moment, 30 grand is support or 29. Mm. Yeah. And um, the, there's another good technical fra phrase. The more times a level is tested, the less likely it is to hold. Yeah. And at the moment, 2930 has held. But if we go back there again and retest it, I'm not sure it will hold. Mm. So much support at 20 grand because it was the old 2016 high. So, so much support there. Uh, I would have thought, you know, go to 20 grand, kiss it goodbye, and then rally is a, is a realistic scenario. But I'm actually looking, if you take a, um, you draw a channel and you take the May high and the, when was the last high? November, December? When was it? I forget. Yeah, Bitcoin, I, mean, I think it was somewhere it, near the end of the last year. Whenever yeah. it was. So take the May high and the December high, which was slightly higher, and you draw the upper line of the channel there. And then you take the low from after the May correction when it went to 29 grand and you take all the lows since then, you've actually got mm. a perfect parallel channel uh, of parallel lines. Very big channel. It's like got about mm. a 30 grand range to it. But Bitcoin is currently within that channel. And that the upper end of the channel is currently in the 70s and the lower end is uh, in the low 30s. And at the moment, Bitcoin's trading in that channel. Don't tell mm. anyone. It's my little secret. But at the moment, that's working quite well thing about well, technical definitely... things is they work for a bit and then they stop working. Yeah, I mean, you, you can definitely see patterns in the market. I mean, a lot of people watching this stream are into like Hex and Pulse Chain. They don't trade because one of Richard's kind of like, you know, core, uh, you know, ethos is don't trade because you get wrecked. And I think a lot well, of people... Well, he's right. But yeah. it's it... I don't necessarily trade, but it's often nice to know where you are in the scheme of things. Of course. Yeah, no, it's definitely, I mean, and also you want to get good entry points, whether you're buying hex or, or, or Ethereum or whatever, but you know, the, the hex community and the pulse chain community is a lot about buying and holding. And, mm -hmm. you know, he has a good thing that he says, you know, people that hold, and if you just held Bitcoin from the beginning, right, you're never going to out trade that 6.9 million X. So getting into good projects early, holding for the long time for the long term uh, is going to see you 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 um you're going to have less stress and you're going to probably get much better returns than you would trying to jump in and out of the markets yeah i mean it varies from coin to coin because mm. like my my buddy put in money the very first time coinbase raised some seed money he put mm. um some money into that and you look at the valuation of coinbase when it ipo'd if he just held on to the bitcoin <laughs> he would have done better and coinbase yeah. is one of the most extraordinary success stories ever yeah um, or it was anyway and so but bitcoin was better but if he hadn't put the money into coinbase he wouldn't have held because mm. he would have been tempted he would have been driven to sell sure so, so, so i kind of forgot about it in a way <laughs> well in, in putting it to coinbase into a private company he was forced to hold mm. but let's just say like I remember the first bull market when it went to twelve hundred dollars Bitcoin, hmm. and it was uh, like the everyone was Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the same price as an ounce of gold, and and I I remember thinking this is just extraordinary, this is I've got to sell here, this will never happen again. Hmm. A Bitcoin the same price as an ounce of gold. I mean here we are today, and Bitcoin's um, probably. 20 times the ounce yeah. the price of an ounce of gold. Yeah, like hit about but that's where it was then. 
and there was a coin called world coin and i if i could find the wallet i've still got some world coin somewhere and you know it was like the fourth highest on the coin market cap i think coin market cap existed mm. but I th and i think monero existed ethereum didn't exist yet and there were some other stupid ones and um you know they were all experiments they, i don't think they were even scams at this point i think they were just experiments idle yeah. experiments um and but like what's happened to world coin hmm. you know and so if you held if, yeah exactly but it was like the one it was like the sort of um you know the light coin or the or the what's what's the sort of what's the sort of number one transactional coin now after bitcoin for just tran basic transacting that doesn't even have a purpose is, is it still like, you know, Dash was cool for a bit and w whatever in that Bitcoin cash was in that sort of category for a bit. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, it was in that kind of category. And um, it was, you know, it was huge. But if you just you had to trade that one because mm. you know, it's, it's fine holding as long as you're holding the right asset. But if you're holding the wrong asset, then then that that philosophy doesn't work. And I guess Richard has got untold belief in his asset and he doesn't want sellers doesn't want people mm. selling it so he advocates holding well it's isn't yeah of course it, i mean with hex and and this is like DeFi 2.0 you know gone in the day well not gone in the day some people are still doing it but just buying an asset and, and and hoping for asset appreciation great if you get some cool but the holy grail now is DeFi 2.0 like hex where you're going to get the asset appreciation and you're going to get yield on top of that by locking up so I'm not sure if you know how Hex works, but you can stake it, right? And the longer you lock it up for, the more you get paid in, it's, in, it's, a, it's not interest, it's actually inflation. So the total supply of Hex inflates every year, 3.69% and that gets pay, paid to the stakers. So kind of, yeah, I think the, those are the old days of, 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 of crypto and some people are still doing it, right? They're betting on meme coins, dog coins or whatever. But now with D DeFi 2.0, People want passive income. They want yield as well on top of the asset appreciation. So stuff like Hex does that. Pulse Chain and the whole ecosystem has lots of new protocols that can do that because we have Pulse X, which is the decentralized exchange, which is basically Uniswap that's on Ethereum, which is going to be on, on Pulse Chain. And you can also stake that token too. So there's lots of ways now to make money just, just along with asset appreciation, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I did some staking for a bit and then yeah, they changed yeah. the rates. <laughs> so well, there's no point me taking on the, it was a good rate before and now it's a rubbish rate. So I'm not doing it anymore. What was that on? BlockFi. BlockFi again. So that's again, Richard, you know, and a lot of people watching this are going to be against that because that's not really crypto, right? You're giving your crypto to a centralized party and hoping that they're not, they're not going to get hacked. They're going to give yeah. you, give you your crypto back. Government isn't going to come in and say, hang on, you know that's that's not legal. We're gonna we're gonna take that away yeah. from you, or what's not? Actually, I I know you're a big proponent of decoupling from overreaching yeah. government who've been. Um, I tell you, you know, I, did, I was just going to tell you another one. I've I stake quite a lot on is is called Decred. Okay. And I don't know. If, are you familiar with that one? No. Is it, is it uh, again? It's like, really kind cool. There's, there's quite a lot of arseholes in the Decred community, but they that it is. It's one of those ones. It was a really the guys who designed Decred were key to the design of the Lightning Network way back mm. when, the Bitcoin Lightning Network. And they all, all the coders behind the scenes, they all fell off and they went off and did Decred. And it's kind of really cool and it's really good and it's privacy and it's Lightning transactions if you want them and it's proof of stake and mm. proof of work and all the rest of it. But, you know, Decred was a top 20 coin. It's probably not even a top 100 coin now. So it's like all these things. It almost doesn't matter how good the tech is. If there's no network to back it up, it, it just disappears up its own backside. And that's kind of what's happened to Decred. No matter how good the tech is, hmm. it's got no network. But the but the staking is cool. Staking is cool. But what's even better is trustless yield. Because when you stake with BlockFi or Celsius or Decred, I'm not sure who they are. Again, it's oh, like... It's, that, it's decentralized. It, Decred is decentralized? Yeah, yeah. It's very good like that. So you hold the keys, you, you, you interact with code and nobody else. Is that right? 
yeah, yeah, when you stay, yeah, 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 100%. Okay, great. It's like it's very pure like that. Yeah, so that's what that's what you know true DeFi should be. It shouldn't be you sending your money to BlockFi or someone and saying, Oh, or no, you no, give me seven percent like a year. So and that's yeah, what Hex and this new kind of era is is ushering in with obviously Ethereum started it with all the you know, with all the dApps and the decentral decentralized protocols. And now Pulse Chain is gonna take the baton and run I mean, with it because it's I'm gonna just be checking that. I'm pretty sure the staking is decentralized. You have to buy you get a ticket, you stake some money and you get a ticket. I'm mm. now you're now making me doubt my uh oh I haven't got time to look it up now but but anyway I'm pretty sure I'm somebody who's listening will know when you come back on another time let me know check it out and yeah. let me know so do you prefer do you prefer I know you're a gold bug I know you uh you like gold and precious metals to make up part of your portfolio do you prefer those to crypto and digital assets no, no. Okay. I hate them I hate you them hate gold I well, I like it in principle, but, 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 you know, I put, I remember I bought like, uh, I forget what the exact figure was, but this would be 2007. Mm. And I put a lot of money into silver. Yeah. And the reason I put money into silver was, um, I thought, like, I can't stand the housing market. I, I, I can hear from your accent, you're from the UK. Mm. And I can't stand the housing market in the UK and what it's done to kids and how expensive it is relative to what you get. And it just drives me insane that house prices are so expensive. And it's 100% a consequence of fiat money and, and all the rest yeah. of it and not measuring inflation properly and yada, yada. And I looked at the ratio between silver and house prices and there was a time i'm going to get this wrong because the it's so long since i looked at the figures but i want to say that in 1980 when the silver price spiked 1000 ounces of silver would buy you the average uk house okay okay and that was like a one off moment for a little bit and a 1000 ounces of silver today you know, silver's 25 bucks. So a thousand ounces of silver would be uh, um, 25 grand. Is that right? Have I got my maths right? $25 for a thousand yeah. ounces. So it'd yeah. be 25,000. Yeah. So maybe it was 10. Yeah. So it was, would have been 1,000 ounces. Hmm. And the way I thought the economy was going in 2006, seven, I thought gold and silver were going to rise. I thought the... There was going to be an implosion of debt. Interest rates were going to spike and we were going to have some kind of debt implosion and a return to the gold standard would be the end result. And I got like three quarters of it right. But the one bit I didn't see happening is I thought with with the interest rates would have to spike to protect the currency. I didn't realize they'd go to zero. And so. But anyway, I looked at silver and it's an industrial meth metal with a million different uses. Um, you know, it's a play on technology because it's, you know, there's silver in every phone and every computer. Um, it's also a monetary metal. So it's got its use as money. I looked at the gold to silver ratio. And at the time it was like 50 or 60. And if you look at the ratio of silver in the ground relative to gold, in the Earth's crust, I mean, it's it should be 15 to 20. And that's the old historical average. And I looked at all these things and I just thought, I can buy 25, 50 grand's worth of silver now. And it wasn't even that. It was like 10 grand. And in a few years' time, I am going to be able to buy myself a palace. Okay? With all these arguments that I just think. And I put mm -hmm. all that money in. and then. I remember when silver went to $50 in 2011, it was like, it was great, but it was not enough. I could mm. feel it was overblown. So I actually got out of silver and got into gold in 2011. I was very pleased with that trade, but I never converted that, you know, one tenth the value of a house investment becomes the value of a house. You know, mm. it was, it was supposed to be a 10 or a hundred bagger relative with houses coming down and silver going up by the time you do the two. And of course, Bitcoin did that a million times over. 
And, you know, you put 10 grand in Bitcoin in 2011. I dread to think what it's worth now. 10, 10 grand in Bitcoin in 2011 is probably Billions. hundreds of millions of pounds today. Yeah, maybe more. And so that's why I don't like gold and silver, because mm. everything that was supposed to happen with gold and silver has happened. Only it didn't happen with gold and silver. It happened with Bitcoin and crypto. Mm. So when did you first get into Bitcoin? I got given my first Bitcoins uh, when they were like, I've, I've actually looked at my first email in my account that mentions Bitcoin. And I'm going to get my years wrong, but I want to say it was December 2010. Wow. And there was an article in PC World magazine. Mm. And somebody had forwarded the article in PC World because I was known then writing about gold and silver and the end fiat money and all the rest of it. And I'd written this film, The Four Horsemen, and, and that was very popular. And, mm. or, or, and and so and and so I got, I got this email that I subscribed to, which is an email about how to become an expat. And he would always have subversive. It was a newsletter before mm. the Substack days. And he would always have. You know, you can get a passport in this country. You can get a resident in this country. And it was mentioned this new crypto thing. And it was four cents. No, no, no. It was 21 cents because I went back and looked. It was 20 cents a coin. And I looked mm. at that. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's cool. And then I forgot about it. <laughs> You'd be a billionaire now if you looked. Yeah, well, exactly. A then. bit like I did with with Richard's pulse thing two or three months ago. Mm. And then. Over the course of the next six months, people would just get in touch and they go, you've got to look at this thing called Bitcoin. You've got to look at this Bitcoin. And actually, I was writing Four Horsemen. So I was so swallowed up with that. Mm. I didn't have time to look at Bitcoin properly. And then people would tell me to get wallets and then they would send me coins. You know, and they'd send you like five Bitcoins, <laughs> which is, um, you know, what five Bitcoins today is 150 grand or probably mm. even more, more like 200 grand uh, US. And they were just sending, you got to look at this thing. And I go, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. And and um, then it went absolutely nuts. So I had a few. And then it went absolutely nuts. And then the MT Gox thing happened. Mm. And I was like, oh, I'm not fucking doing that. Is you, where are we keeping them? And then it, went to, then it went to this price of an ounce of gold. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. And then the first bear market came. And then I started buying in after that first bear market. I remember when the Winklevoss twins bought in at $100. Hmm. And I was going, they're mugs. They're paying too much. Idiots. You know, I knew about this thing when it was $1, $10. Yeah. But I, just didn't put in, I, I should have just did what I did with silver with Bitcoin. And anyway, I still had loads because people just used to give them to me. And I bought a few and I tried out localbitcoins.com. And I was right. And so I actually wrote that book there. Um. First book on Bitcoin from a recognized publisher. It was a catch up trade. I thought I've missed this trade. I've missed the bottom. I'll write a book about it and I'll become the main guy who writes about it. And anyway, and then so and how many people do you know who've said to you, oh, I've heard about Bitcoin. If only I got on mm. Like for every person that bought in early and held, there are a, a thousand that missed the boat. And yeah. we all missed the boat in our own different ways. We all bought at two dollars got five times our money and sold at $10 because we made yeah. five times our money. And what a stupid bunch, what a stupid trade that was. But you didn't know it at the time. You made five times your money. It's just normal um, uh, money management to, course. to take your stake off the same. Profits, so all this, yeah. And then 20, it would be 2014, 2015. I'm, I lose track of the years. I went to this dinner at a, in a private room in a restaurant in, in London. And I've been to a lot of lavish mining dinners in full bull market dinners when everyone's ordering top um, wines and stuff. And loads of the sort of big guns of the Bitcoin world at the time were there. Max Kaiser, Stacey, mm. all loads of people there at this dinner. And it was like Richard Hart levels of decadence at this dinner. The only time I've and it was just so decadent. And just 300, 400, 500 quid bottles of wine, one after the other. Mm. I don't know who paid for it. But everyone who went to that dinner got hacked. We all got our Bitcoins taken from us. How? Um, I'll tell you how. Because they sent out an invite and you accepted the invite with the, um, you know, when somebody sends you an invite and you just click on the link to accept the mm. invite, do the thing. 
And then about two hours later, the same invite went out. And I remember thinking, that's a bit weird. Why have they done that? Yeah. But I clicked on it again. And in clicking on it again, I gave the, whoever it was, got, I don't know if they put a keyboard logger on my thing or somehow, mm. but they were able to break into my Gmail webmail. And, and I didn't have T 2FA in those days. So they mm. must have somehow got my passport or some password or got into my Gmail. And then I had a wallet with blockchain.org and I had the very first archived wallet in my old webmail that I didn't, I hadn't um, got rid of or downloaded. Anyway, they found it there and they were able to hack all my coins like that. And ev not everyone at the dinner got hacked because some people had proper security in place, mm. but everyone who was at the dinner attempted to be hacked Jesus. and i know you know it was like 50 100 coins that kind of level um more even and, and and we all got hacked and and i know guys i still talk to them about it and it, it's it's just like it then i was so angry about it hmm. that because at the time it was like tens of thousands of pounds maybe maybe yeah. a bit more maybe even 100 grand at the time um and I found, and like I saw it, like about five minutes after it happened, and I've got even got the guy's email address somewhere who did it. Um, I mean, it was like you know, generic name at gmail.com. Mm. But you know, I was able. I was emailing, go, oh, come on, mate, send them back. <laughs> but he didn't. And but then to so I'd still had the appreciation from you know being given these coins and holding them to them being worth tens of thousands of dollars. Mm. But then. In order to buy them back, um, I would have then had to spend tens of thousands of dollars. And I couldn't bring myself to do that because that would have been realizing the loss there yeah. and then. So I didn't. And I remember talking to Roger Veer, who's a sort of buddy of mine about it. A few mm. years later, we went out to dinner and it, and Matonis as well, John Matonis. And they it was a really common hack at the time, apparently. And, and, and they managed to fix it. But the same thing happened to Roger. And Roger had like over a hundred grand's worth of Bitcoin nicked off him. I think he might even have had over a hundred Bitcoins nicked off him because Roger's been an obvious yeah, yeah. target yeah. for a long time. And, you know, this is credit where credit's due. And this is why Roger's as rich as he is, is, um, and, and because he believed in, this is why he was Bitcoin Jesus. He be had so much belief in Bitcoin that he just went straight out and bought all the bitcoins that he had stolen off them wow. he bought the same amount back so he took the loss then rather mm. than sit there and watch bitcoin go to twenty thousand dollars or whatever the price when it went on that next bull market and have mm. and, and and mourn what he missed out on so and and i guess i never quite had the level of belief in it that roger had uh, I had it philosophically, but but Roger probably had more belief in the tech and everything. Yeah. And that's what you need in a bull market. You need to indoctrinate yourself. Hmm. And the problem is that can lead to self-delusion. But to ride a full bull market right to the very end, you have to believe in whatever it is, the company. You know, if you're going to ride Tesla right to the top, you have to believe that Teslas are an amazing car. Hmm. If you don't, if you think Tesla's or whatever, you're not gonna you're gonna sell too early. If you think the Bitcoin or Hex or whatever it is is amazing, you've got to indoctrinate yourself as to how amazing it is. And that's why you need people like Richard, who are brilliant promoters, but also hmm. brilliant people. And you go, well, I'm not just investing in Hex. I'm investing in Richard Hart, or I'm investing in Vladimir Buterin. You know, hmm. because that 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 gives you the belief. Uh, um. And that's one of the things, by the way, about crypto that differs from gold and silver is you look at people in gold and silver mining. They're not the greatest intellects in the world. You look at people in crypto. There are some mm. seriously bright people. 150 plus IQs are not uncommon, you know, verging on the spectrum, a lot of them, but really seriously bright. And you think, well, if I can buy a crypto tracker fund, which is basically Bitcoin or Ethereum, well, I'm getting exposure to the combined um, effects of all those intellects, hmm. you know, so that's one reason. But anyway, so that's a really long winded rambling story as to my mixed relationship of, of why I dislike gold and silver and why I admire Bitcoin and my frustrations with it. And hmm. don't get me wrong. I've done very well out of Bitcoin and I'm very happy with it. 
but I haven't. I'm one of the many guys who should be a hundred millionaire, a billionaire, you know, up there with the Winkle Vosses. Mm. <laughs> and I miss that particular boat. But the bottom line is, if you're if you're going to make it to the moon, you've got to have a ticket on the rocket. If you haven't got a ticket on the rocket, you're not going to get to the moon. A hundred percent. Well, first off, going back to what you said, security is paramount, and I'm sure you've learned your lesson. And I certainly have. Hopefully anyone watching this is using hardware wallets. Their seed phrases are written down on paper, and they're never, ever clicking any links that anyone sends them. And if a, if a Nigerian prince ever gets in contact, it's not a Nigerian prince, and uh, they're not going to send you double back. But Going back to also what you said about selling too early. Well, that's obviously why Hex was created. And we have that, we have hindsight now, right? Nobody knew in 2012 or 13 or 14 or whatever, what Bitcoin on Ethereum, when that came out in 2016, what it could do. Now we can see that those things can do millions of X, right? Tens of thousands of X um, on the low end then that's why Hex and Pulse Chain and this whole new ecosystem that Richard Hart's building is going to be very interesting because all the heck he's drilled into everyone's head about delayed gratification, right? You don't get rich or you don't accrue life-changing wealth by trading or jumping into this coin or that coin. You get into a good project early and you hold long-term. And when Pulse Chain comes out, we've got a whole kind of society, a community of people who are going to be doing that they're not going to be selling on a 10x or a 5x or a, even a 100x. A lot of them are going to be waiting for a 1,000x or 10,000x. So it's going to be like diamond hands on steroids. But it is interesting to see, you know, how that you you went through that. You have to go through those hard times, right? Like losing the Bitcoin or being hacked or or not buying early enough to to now know. Okay, when I see something good, I'm going to get in there and and, and get a good position at least. Do you think crypto is the way to decouple from uh, the overreaching governments that we have these days? Um, uh, yes, I do. Uh, I think we're going into, I mean, this is, this is going to be old arguments for a lot of your viewers, but I think we're going into a Hayekian world of competing currencies. Hmm. And we're already in a Hayekian world of competing currencies. At the analog level, we've got gold and silver, and then we've got national currencies. We've got corporate currencies a little bit, you know, your air miles and Amazon points and all the rest of it. And if Facebook can ever get it off the ground, it's DM and all that. And then you've got cryptocurrencies, open source currencies, whatever you call them. I suppose they're private currencies in a way. Yeah. And they're all competing. And, and you know, Hayek envisaged private companies issuing state money and you compensating for the risk of using state money issued by private companies with higher interest rates. But the mm. fact that private companies would be more likely to have better standards of practice than governments would force good practice on governments. Mm. And the result of all these competing currencies is that, um, you know, good conduct will be will be forced on players if they want to survive and if they want their currencies to be used. Um, so that's one world that we're going into. I wouldn't surprise me if when we go to CBDCs and all the rest of it, if, um, if it ends up being like, if you look at the mess, the NHS made of its NHS COVID app, when it decided it was going to build it itself or when that government minister, that, that, technocrat decided she was going to build it or he was mm. going to build it rather than have apple or google do it and if yeah. they'd had apple or google do it they could have done it for about a tenth of the price and it would have actually worked do you remember all the track and trace stuff that happened yeah it, it, was, a, it, it was it was a shit show it was a shit show now can you imagine central banks doing that with money and cbdc's mm. they you know it's just going to go tits up if they design it they're going to have to get private companies or listed companies to design it now whether it's going to be private banks like hsbc or someone or it may well be you know the guy who designs tether <laughs> heaven right. forbid you yeah. know who comes along and does it. it 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 could be that you know uh, uh, because they're the ones who've got the expertise with stable coins mm. so um so who knows who's going to design them? But I think if they don't get the right people to design them, they're going to be a shit show. Yeah. Um, but there's something ironic about calling uh, 
crypto people in to design CBDCs. There's something very mm. ironic about that. Um, and then the big issue is whether they choose programmable CBDCs, in which case, you know, the end of the world is nigh, or 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 they go for non-programmable ones. Mm. Um, and then, of course, you've got all the Bitcoins and the hexes and all the other cryptocurrencies on that coin market cap list. So that's the world that we're heading into. And the way that cryptocurrency obviates um, uh, nation states and national governments mm -hmm. is because most people who work in crypto are freelancers or they're entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who run their own businesses. There's very few people who have full-time jobs working for one currency. There's a lot of people who moonlight and they've got several jobs. But whereas if you think of the old physical economy of the 1980s, you know, your dad or your granddad or someone who goes to work mm. for one company all his life, that's very rare in crypto. Most yeah. people are doing several different things. And not only that, they're doing several different things in the digital economy on the Internet. Mm. Now, the tax systems have been designed around a physical economy uh, from mm. a different age, from the pre-digital age. Tax systems are derived around individuals who work who live in one place and work for one company that is in one place and goods that come across a clearly defined national border and so there's a tax there and then when they're in that country there's a good there but national borders aren't so clear on the internet and if you're working on the internet for multiple different people and let's say you're moving around you're a digital nomad mm. and you know where is the tax payable where did the border crossing take place where did the labor take place do you yeah. pay the thing of where the labor takes place or where the hiring takes place it's all you know there's arguments it's just not clear in a yeah. way that tax is clear in the in the physical economy and a lot of the time because it's not clear it's just simply from a time point of view easier to be non to be non-compliant it's not like you're deliberately deliberately not trying to pay taxes but mm. just like if you're a digital nomad and you spend three months in in chiang mai and three months in 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 cartagena and three months in in the united states and three months in lisbon it's just not clear where you should pay taxes it really isn't unless you're american mm. and so we're going into the re-smog sovereign individual situation where you're going to see some people trapped in a nation state in the physical economy paying one level of tax and then you're going to see these much wealthier sovereign individuals who flip from some country to country rather like google and starbucks and amazon do at mm. a corporate level and that's how they undermine governments because they're not paying the same level of taxes. Sure. sure and unless yeah. governments design, redesign their tax systems, uh, 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 and instead of thinking punitively, they think practically how, rather than how can we punish these people, how can we attract these people until mm. they start thinking like that, um, that will be the case. You know, because yeah, the I mean, nomad saying is go where you're best treated. Yeah, yeah, the, the old nomad capitalist, um, his, his saying, Andrew Henderson, he's got some interesting takes on, you know, going to obviously ta tax-free countries or, you know, minimizing tax. Actually, I, I want to get your take on this because the protocol that Liquid Loans, we're building uh, for Pulse Chain is something that could be very tax efficient for people because I'm sure, as you know, um, loans aren't uh, subject to capital gains tax. So... Liquid Loans is actually building a protocol or is forking a protocol from Ethereum where you can use your crypto as collateral and then take a loan out against your crypto, but then you still hold on to your crypto. So compared to selling your Bitcoin at $5 and seeing it run up, run up to $69,000, you could have used that Bitcoin as collateral and then take get liquidity to buy a house, buy a car, whatever, and still hold on to your crypto as long as it doesn't dip below a certain amount where you've been. And what liquidated. currencies can you do it for? So this one is Pulse Chain. So if you have Pulse, you can come into the protocol, which is a decentralized front end, deposit your Pulse into a vault, and then extract USDL, a stable coin, and then go out into the real world, use that. And in most jurisdictions, loans aren't uh, subject to capital gains tax. What do you think about that? I think it sounds fantastic. I want to sign up. Where do I sign? What happens well, if Bitcoin goes from $5 to 
And you've Very earned that money at five dollars. So you have to be. Here's the difference with this protocol and protocols like it. That's, that's it's the, the margin opposite. call from hell. <laughs> exactly, but it's the complete opposite because where in the real world, as you know, the banks are fractionally reserved. In these protocols, you have to be over collateralized. So if you want to use liquid loans and you want to take a loan for say ten thousand US dollars, the yeah. minimum that you can put into the vault to get that ten thousand US dollars in stablecoin would be. $11,000. That means you're 110% collateralized. Although we wouldn't recommend that. We'd recommend three, four, 500, even a thousand percent. So if you want to take a $10,000 loan, you put in a hundred thousand dollars worth of collateral. The market would have to dip by over 90% or around 89% for you to be up for liquidation. So if you, so if you're, if you're. The problem is, the problem, I, I hear the, the logic. The problem with that is, you know, most people want to put down 10 grand and borrow 90 grand and buy a house. Of course, and obviously, at, everyone's an adults. So they have to do what they what, what they want to do. But you have to take responsibility for yourself. And at least three four hundred percent would be a safe collateral ratio. And then there's no you know as you know in the legacy finance system, you go to a bank, you've got to be approved for a credit card, a loan, a mortgage. If you get rejected, it's going to affect your credit rating. Maybe then you've got interest payments. Then you've got fixed terms. With these DeFi loans, there's no interest. There's no uh, repayment terms. You never have to pay back your loan if you don't want to, as long yeah. as you'll have enough collateral in your vault. I've got you. And you're not subject to capital gains tax. Obviously, everyone needs to check depending on where they live, but in most jurisdictions in the world, loans, are, loans aren't taxable. So this is, a, and I know you, I'm bringing this up because I know you're a big, you're a big um, proponent on uh, reducing taxes or having government restructure their tax mm -hmm. systems because obviously we're getting taxed out the yin yang all the time left right and center um so would you use something like that would you use a crypto loan yeah 100 percent. okay but, oh, cool. but with a certain amount of trepidation yeah of course and and and, and no one's saying um you know be risky That's about not me it. advocating by the way uh people to to do that you know do your own due diligence and all that stuff but but it's the model sounds very enticing Absolutely. Well, people have been doing it for years. As you know, they take real estate, they take property, they use it as collateral to get more liquidity from the bank. If you default on your loan, the bank comes and takes your house. Well, in this sense, if you if your collateral drops below a certain ratio, then you could be liquidated and lose that. But the, the difference is the most you'd only ever lose is 10% because you got your 90% up front in stablecoin. So there's no there's no repayment terms yeah. that you have to pay back this. So th this is this is where we're going, you know, with DeFi 2.0. You can lock up money, you can stake it, you can get high interest, high yield. You can use your crypto as collateral and, and acquire liquidity. And legacy finances are going to be left in the, you know, left just you know, in in uh, floating down the river like a dead body. Because yeah, how can you it, it will be. But don't forget that for all the. Um... What's the word for all the worship of decentralized technology? Mm. There are a lot of people who don't want to, they want something centralized. They want someone who's going to hold their hand. Yeah. They want to be able to look the bank in the eye and trust the bank and all the rest of it. So there are, so there is, there is that factor. Mm. Oh, I, I'm sure there'll always be a certain portion of society that are going to want that, right? You know, the group think yeah. culture, they want the government to tell them what to do. They want the bank to tell them what to do. That being said, anyone with half a brain, if I could say, listen, go, go to the bank and you've got to go through a rigorous process of being approved. You've got to have, you know, high interest rate, fixed terms. If you default your credit ratings in the toilet or you come over here, all you need is an internet connection, a wallet with the right crypto. And it doesn't matter where you are, how much you earn, as long as you have enough crypto or whatever the protocol requires, you can interact with that. There's no, you know, there's no discrimination. So, yeah, I think I mean, it's definitely going to take once uh, you're in the system, once you're in the system, that's it's going to be very attractive, your model. For sure. Well, this is coming out on Pulse Chain soon. So, yeah, I, I was I, I did want to get your take on it because I know you do like reducing taxes or, you know, mitigating it if you can. Listen, it's been really interesting, uh, Dominic, coming on here. I really appreciate you, your time. But before I let you go, I just want to ask you one more question because, sure. you know, as we've seen, COVID restrictions are, by the looks of it, coming to an end. And now World War Three seems to be kicking off in Eastern Europe. What do you think this means for the markets in the short and long term? 
Um, well, at the moment, we seem to be going through a rare period where real stuff has more value than digital stuff. Mm. Commodities, there's a demand for commodities, grains. You know, I think Ukraine produces enough grain to feed 600 million people. Wow. Um, uh, Russia is obviously sh huge amounts of grain. R Ukraine is one of the biggest producers of iron ore, titanium, magnesium, mercury. Mm. So there's a lot of... Uh, upset in the supply chains of essential commodities and that's why we're in a bull market for oil for metals for grains and for uh to a certain extent possibly for precious metals um so at the moment that's where we are but it won't last forever commodities are famously cyclical cyclical they can they can fall at the drop of the hat similarly technologies in a bear market it's been in a bear market six nine months the 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 arse hasn't fallen out of the big guns with the exception of facebook but i wonder if it will or not um so that's where we are for the moment but it, it won't last forever and and uh you know over this whole ukraine thing it's not like there's any shortage of use cases for bitcoin that we've seen i, I interviewed a guy who had escaped the ukraine uh, and he was trying to raise money for Ukraine and he was doing it via cryptocurrency for some people and doing it via fiat for others. And the fiat thing he was trying to provide it by got closed off a bit like the truckers go fund me in Canada. Mm -hmm. And the only one that worked was the was the crypto. So, you know, there yeah. really is. And, and if you're a refugee trying to escape, if you're a soldier trying to send money home, if you're a if you're. A, a Russian who's just seen your currency lose 30% of its value overnight. You know, there's so many use cases for Bitcoin at the moment. Um, you know, if you don't agree with what your, you know, money, money loses its purchasing power in war. It doesn't really matter mm. what side of the war you're on. And so you need um, alternate, alternate hedges. And, and at the moment it's hard things, but it won't be forever. And, 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 you've got to be bullish Bitcoin and crypto long term. It's it's obviously the future. Yeah. This secret is just picking the right horse at the right price. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, thanks again for your time. I do appreciate everything that you do, your channel. You know, I've been watching it for quite a while. And uh, when I get some time, I definitely want to dive into that Bitcoin book of yours and uh, and see. And also you've got another one out, I think. Uh, what's your what's your what's your most recent book that came out? My most recent book's that one there. Day, uh, sorry, that one there. Daylight Robbery. How tax will shape our past and, and how tax shaped our past and will change our future. It's very good. I've got a number of other projects I'm working on, but if mm. if if any of your listeners are interested, uh, Substack is the place, frisbee.substack.com. Yeah. And I've got a new newsletter that I've started on there a week ago. And um uh I'll be tipping there's the free model where I'll just write about the markets once a week and I'll write about some important issue. Like last week I did uh why privacy matters article, mm. the essay on privacy at the weekend and and then i was writing about gold during the week so that kind of thing i'm a very compelling and engaging writer don't you know and um but then there's a paid one that you can subscribe and you can I, i'm pretty good on mining companies and that kind of thing and i'm not bad on crypto not as good as you but but i, I think i've got a secret weapon but but anyway if you want to invest in the paid one the profits will more than repay you for buying my paid newsletter but frisbee.substack.com frisbee.substack definitely go and check that out well listen man let's keep um, learning about pulse chain and uh we'll stay in touch and i'll i'll send you any, some info on liquid loans and stuff because uh yeah it's coming down the pipe and i'm sure you're going to be interested in it matt if you want to write an essay on uh you know 800 words hmm. explaining pulse chain what it is how yep. we invest why we should invest in simple language for baby boomers sure <laughs> you've I'd, I'd gladly uh host that on substack for you if, if i'll get that over to you i'll get that yeah. over to you in the next month i promise okay good stuff great thanks for your time Cheers, Dominic. i've really enjoyed talking to you you look like a very smart and intelligent and articulate young man and i wish i was as clever as you when i was your age thank I'll you well you're gonna you're gonna have to come back on the show at some point because i've enjoyed this and i'm sure that the viewers are going to want to see more of uh mr dominic frisbee for sure with pleasure cheers take care
Guys, what a great interview with the man, the myth, the legend. If you like that video, guys, do hit that subscribe button and that bell icon so you're notified every time we drop new videos on the channel. You can also share the video with someone who you think it may benefit. Tap the like button and even drop a comment below on the replay for the algo. I hope everyone is having a great Monday. Thanks for watching and I will see you tomorrow on the next one. Peace.